hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to cardiology lectures i am dr nick nickam i'm a cardiologist from houston texas today we are going to be talking about ekg interpretations this is based on my book clinical ekg interpretation and patient management you can take a look at this book on amazon.com and please watch our previous two videos that cover introduction and bundle branch blocks in this presentation we will focus on chamber enlargements so let us begin in this chapter we are going to be talking about left atrial enlargement right atrial enlargement by atrial enlargement left ventricular hypertrophy right ventricular hypertrophy biventricular hypertrophy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies and their electrocardiographic findings so there is a lot to cover in this presentation let's continue as you can see here is a diagram of the heart and we're going to look at the right atrial enlargement then we're going to look at the left atrial enlargement we are also going to look at some conditions where we have both the right and the left atrial enlargement then we are going to focus on right ventricular hypertrophy after that we are going to look at the left ventricular hypertrophy and conclude with the electrocardiographic features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy whenever we are looking at an enlargement of a chamber we should always keep in mind that these things do not happen in isolation if we are looking at left atrial enlargement chances are very high that you may also see some changes in the left ventricle or in the right atrium or the right ventricle similarly if we are seeing changes in the right ventricle we should also be expecting some changes in the right atrium and along with that we could also expect some changes in the electrical axis of the heart based upon which chamber is enlarged so let us continue take a look at this uh, electrocardiogram and uh, see what or the findings that you can identify then we will continue you can pause the video here and when you are ready you can resume if you look at lead 1 there is a deep s wave and lead avf is positive so just looking at these two leads we can notice the electrical axis is on the right side because we have lead 1 which is negative to a large extent then we have avf which is positive and if you look at lead 2 which is sort of uh, iso electric or equiphasic and here is lead 2 which is 60 you are looking at 90 degrees from here which will be like 150 degrees so this is a case of a right axis deviation along with that we also have peaked p waves uh, which measure almost uh, 3 mm in height you see these peaked p waves in lead 2 3 avf and along with that we have tall r waves in the anterior leads so here we see a combination of right axis deviation right atrial enlargement right ventricular hypertrophy and one more additional feature i would like to bring your attention is the stt chain whenever we see a hypertrophy we see the st segments going downwards with an inverted t wave this is known as the discordant stt changes these are very important findings and we will talk about its significance as we proceed further so to summarize we have right axis deviation right atrial enlargement right ventricular hypertrophy with discordant stt changes if you look at this is how the p wave looks in a patient with right atrial enlargement the normal p wave in patients uh, with no right atrial enlargement is less than 2.5 millimeters 
and the width is less than 0.2 seconds or 120 milliseconds or three boxes. Whereas in case of right atrial hypertrophy, the P waves are typically taller than 2.5 millimeters, but uh, they are not wider than 120 milliseconds. Switch gears and talk about left atrial enlargement. As you know, the P wave represents both the right and the left atrial activity. In patients with the left atrial enlargement, instead of seeing peaked P waves as we saw with the right atrial enlargement, here we see a double hump. The first one is from the right atrium. The second hump is from the left atrium. So if you look at lead one, you're going to see this uh, double hump similarly in lead two. But when you go to lead three, you see a little different morphology. And most importantly, when you go to V1, we have an initial tiny upstroke, which represents the right atrial activity, then a negative deflection in V1, which is representing the left atrial abnormality, left atrial enlargement, whatever you want to call it. And if we magnify this, you can see here, this negative deflection in V1, if it occupies more than one small box, this is bigger than one box. So that is suggestive of a left atrial enlargement or left atrial abnormality. So let's keep this in mind. This is one of the hallmark findings for left atrial enlargement. That is the negative deflection in V1 which covers more than one box. Okay, here is an example, contrast to the first one we saw. Now we have a tall R wave in one, AVL. We have a double hump in two, three, and AVF. And we have a negative deflection in V1, which is occupying more than one box. But along with that, we also see some other changes. As I told you at the beginning, whenever you see a change that is reflective of one chamber, always think about uh, any other conditions that may be associated with uh, that particular condition. So we are focusing on left atrial enlargement, but if you look at the voltage in one AVL, V4, V5, V6, we are looking at left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is just not a case of uh, left uh, atrial enlargement. Here we see left atrial enlargement. We also see left ventricular hypertrophy with discordant STT changes. Ah, remember that discordant STT changes. And along with that, we now see a left axis deviation. If lead two is equiphasic, and if you take lead two here, and AVF is negative, so it should be in this area. So if lead two is uh, equiphasic, then the axis should be minus 30 degrees. However, there is more negative deflection than the positive deflection, so the axis should be much greater than 30 degrees, somewhere between 30 and minus 90 degrees because your AVF is negative. So that gives minus 45 degrees uh, axis which is left axis deviation. So there are a lot of findings in this electrocardiogram and it is important to look for every little detail in the electrocardiogram. When you are answering your cardiology board exams, remember that every point is counted. This is sinus rhythm, right? Sinus rhythm, left axis deviation, left anterior hemiblock, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy with discordant STT changes. Now let's move on to the next tracing, which looks at the contrasting features of normal P waves, right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement. As we told you, the P waves are usually a single hump and the P waves uh, is the P wave in V1 is less than one small box. Whereas with right atrial enlargement, you see the P waves are tall, peaked with a single peak, uh, 
and then we have a positive deflection with a small negative deflection in V1. In left atrial enlargement, we see a double hump followed by a significantly negative deflection occupying more than one small square. So that is as far as the P waves are concerned. And I want to emphasize again, whenever you see enlargement of the atria, always think about what's happening to the chambers behind and afterwards. The P waves are not always biphasic or peaked. There are a variety of P waves that we come across and it is worthwhile to look at those because they may directly or indirectly signify atrial enlargement. Let's talk about atrial fibrillation. The atrial fibrillation has P waves which are barely visible, sort of undulating waves, faster than 350 beats per minute. But in fact, it has been said that if you see atrial fibrillation, it may be equivalent to the left atrial enlargement. Similarly, we see flutter waves, which are quite different in morphology from the P waves we see in patients with a normal sinus rhythm. If you have a wandering pacemaker, the P wave morphology can change from beat to beat, and it is important to recognize this. Sometimes if the atrial impulses are coming from the low atrium, we may see negative P waves in lead 2, 3, and AVF. We may see negative P waves in leads 2, 3, and AVF. If we have an AV nodal re-entry tachycardia, the P waves may be retrograde. That means the P waves may either appear as negative deflections immediately before the QRS complex or immediately following the narrow QRS complex. Multifocal atrial tachycardia has P wave morphology varying from beat to beat, but in case of multifocal tachycardia, the heart rate is a little bit uh, slower so that you can actually see the distinct variable P wave morphology on the tracing. So let's keep in mind some of these uh, findings because uh, they also signify underlying cardiovascular problems. Because if you have atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, it may suggest uh, left atrial enlargement. Whereas if you have multifocal atrial tachycardia, then you are talking about chronic lung disease. Let's move on to ventricular hypertrophy. When we are talking about ventricular hypertrophy, there are several things we need to focus. First, I talked about the electrical axis as we were reviewing the previous electrocardiograms. That is number one. The electrical axis is looking at the way the impulse is traveling in the frontal plane. Next, we need to look at the horizontal plane where we put the chest leads. That tells us as to which ventricle is actually involved in the hypertrophy or enlargement. And the third point I want to emphasize is the discordant STT changes. Please keep that in mind. It is essential for us to understand the discordant STT changes we see in patients with either right or the left ventricular hypertrophy. So to summarize, we look at the electrical axis, which can give us some information, the QRS voltage, which is going to tell us which ventricle is involved, then discordant STT changes. Now here's the difference between a normal V1, which has a small R wave and a deep S wave, whereas in patients with right ventricular hypertrophy, we may see a tall R wave followed by an S wave. Okay, let's look at some examples here. We already saw this one before, but to emphasize again, so we see right axis deviation, we have right atrial enlargement, then we have tall R waves in the anterior leads. So there are several criteria that suggest we are dealing with the right atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right axis deviation. We talked about this. So here are some of the points that we need to keep in mind. Right atrial enlargement, right axis deviation, uh, pattern of RS in 
or s in v1 and v2 or in v1 is greater than 7 millimeters discordant stt changes as we see them here then some s waves we may not see s waves in this particular tracing but we look at other tracings which will emphasize deep s waves in the lateral chest leads okay take a moment look at this electrocardiogram write down all the positive findings then we will proceed when you are ready you can continue okay let us look at this electrocardiogram first of all the heart rate is very fast it is approximately 150 to 160 beats per minute so we are looking at supraventricular tachycardia there's a p wave preceding each qrs complex so most likely this could be atrial tachycardia or simply sinus tachycardia next we have deep s waves in lead one and positive in positive always in ABF. So we are looking at uh, extreme right axis deviation. It is also supported by the fact that we have tall R waves in AVR. Then we have tall R waves in V1, V2. We have tall R waves in V1, V2, along with the deep S waves I talked about. So to summarize, we have supraventricular tachycardia, at a rate of approximately 160 per minute, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy with discordant STT changes and some non-specific changes in non-specific STT changes in the anterolateral leads. Do you see anything else? We see a non-diagnostic cue in lead three. I say this is non-diagnostic because the Q wave is not greater than 40 milliseconds and the depth of the Q wave is not greater than 25% of the R wave. And we're going to learn more about the Q waves when we talk about the myocardial ischemia and infarction. So let us continue. Okay, what is your diagnosis? Take a moment, write down your diagnosis and we will proceed. All right, we are looking at the sinus rhythm with tall peaked P waves in lead one, two, similarly in lead three. Then we have tall R waves in ABR. There are deep S waves in lead one and tall R waves in AVF. So our axis is almost perpendicular to AVR that means it is uh, almost uh, greater than 120 degrees. So this is right axis deviation. We also have tall R waves with discordant STT changes in the anterior leads. So we are talking about uh, sinus rhythm, right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement, uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, with uh, discordant STT changes. The lateral chest leads look okay. I know what I'm saying is repetitious. Repetition helps you to memorize these things, engrave them in your memory, so that when you look at these electrocardiograms, uh, you would recite them like poetry, because that's what's going to get you marks in your examinations. So to summarize all the points that we can use to diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy, let's look at these. Right axis deviation greater than plus 90 degrees. We talked about that. Or in V1 plus S wave in V5 or 6 greater than 10.5 millimeters. R to S ratio in V1 greater than 1. That is, we are saying the R wave is taller than the S wave. If the S wave is uh, deeper than the R wave in V6, that's one point. Late intrinsicoid deflection. That means the rise of the R wave in V1 may take longer than 35 milliseconds. That's because of the increased thickness of the right ventricle. It takes longer for the impulse to activate the entire right ventricular wall. We may also see incomplete right bundle branch block. 
and I already talked about the discordant STT changes and more often it is associated with the right atrial enlargement or hypertrophy which is sometimes called P pulmonal and occasionally we can see a combination of this uh, S1, S2, S3 pattern which is most often seen in children. Okay, what is your diagnosis? Just take a few moments and we will continue. Basically, we are looking at the sinus rhythm at a rate of 100 per minute because we see a P wave before each QRS complex. Then we have S waves here and S waves here, low voltage. The most obvious finding is that we see low voltage in chest leads. We also have tall R waves in the anterior leads with uh, discordant STT changes. There's also decreased voltage in the lateral chest leads. So what could this be? So we have a patient with uh, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, low voltage. Whenever you look at low voltage in the limb leads uh, with the presence of right ventricular hypertrophy, always think about uh, chronic lung disease. There are also some non-specific uh, STT changes in the inferior leads. Okay, here's another tracing. What is your diagnosis? Again, if you look at here, we have a sinus rhythm with tall peaked P waves. So we have right atrial enlargement. The axis is almost uh, plus 90 degrees because lead one is isoelectric. So we have right axis deviation and there's also loss of R waves here in the anterior leads. When you see loss of R waves in the anterior leads, low QRS voltage, right atrial enlargement with right axis deviation, you always think about chronic lung disease, COPD, emphysema, whatever you want to call it, because these are some of the findings that are consistent with chronic lung disease. Let us continue. Okay, take a moment, see what your diagnosis is, and then we will continue. All right, we have a sinus tachycardia at a rate of 150 per minute. There are definite P waves here. Sometimes when you see a rate of 150 with a narrow QRS tachycardia, you should always consider the possibility of atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction. But here the P waves are very distinct. There's no distortion of the, the STT segment. So this is most likely sinus tachycardia. Along with that, we have right ventricular hypertrophy with the S waves going all the way to V5 and V6. So this is an example of a sinus tachycardia with the right ventricular hypertrophy with STT changes in V1 and some non-specific STT changes in the inferior leads. Another important thing I want to bring to your attention is whenever you see S1 and a Q3 and T3 with a sinus tachycardia, right ventricular hypertrophy or enlargement, you should always think about uh, pulmonary embolus. This is a favorite question for many examiners. It is not really diagnostic of pulmonary embolus. The only thing that is diagnostic of pulmonary embolus is uh, CT angiography. But nonetheless, whenever you see an electrocardiogram like this with the S1, Q3, and T3, if there is an option for pulmonary embolus, keep that in mind. Continue. Here again, we see right axis deviation with the right bundle branch block and significant STT changes. Okay, here we see sinus rhythm. Again, we see right axis deviation, which is uh, greater than 90 degrees. Then we have left atrial enlargement here and also a suggestion of uh, right atrial enlargement along with some non-specific STT changes in the lateral chest leads. Now, when you see things happening all around the heart, you need to begin to put the pieces together. What condition can give left atrial enlargement? Heart failure, mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, atrial fibrillation. 
what condition can give rise to a right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, COPD, pulmonary embolus. So what condition can give rise to right atrial enlargement, atrial septal defect can give rise to both right and left atrial enlargement. So this is how you take the electrocardiogram and try to diagnose what is going on inside the human heart. So if you are seeing left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy with no significant left ventricular enlargement, these three chambers are enlarged. What conditions can give rise to this combination? Atrial septal defect can give rise to increased volume going through the right heart and thus result in right atrial enlargement, left atrial enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy. We can see similar pattern in patients with mitral stenosis who can have left atrial enlargement, right ventricular hypertrophy and with tricuspid regurgitation they can develop uh, right atrial enlargement. Along with that we have some STT changes in the lateral leaves. Good enough? Let us continue. Okay, what is your diagnosis? Again, we see right axis deviation and we have right atrial enlargement with a significant increased voltage in all the leads. Along with that, we have significant increase in voltage in the anterior leads with some STT changes and also in the lateral leads. So what is going on here? Well, there's a tip here. This is a patient who is 18 years old. So we have a right axis deviation and increased voltage in the inferior leads, right ventricular hypertrophy, along with the discordant STT changes, and perhaps increased voltage in the lateral leads also. This may suggest biventricular hypertrophy with the significant STT changes. In an 18-year-old person, significant left ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy, what conditions can give rise to right and left ventricular hypertrophy? One of the conditions could be ventricular septal defect, which will put more strain on the right heart from the left side. And as a result, we can get right ventricular hypertrophy. Along with that, you can get right atrial enlargement, which can lead to right axis deviation. And in addition to that, we also see increased voltage in the lateral chest leads, which may suggest left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is a case of biventricular hypertrophy with right atrial enlargement and discordant STT changes in the chest leads. Here's another example of uh, sinus tachycardia. Here's another example of uh, sinus tachycardia in a 60 year old patient with acute shortness of breath. You already got so many tips here. Sinus tachycardia, S1, Q3, T3, and left atrial enlargement and some STT changes in the anterior leads. What is your diagnosis? We could be dealing with uh, pulmonary embolus. There are a lot of findings which will make you suspicious of pulmonary embolus in the presence of acute shortness of breath in a 60 year old patient. Sinus tachycardia, right axis deviation, S1, Q3, T3 with anterior wall ischemic changes. Let's continue. You know, we looked at several electrocardiograms which showed tall R waves in the anterior leads, V1, V2, V3. But not all tall R waves are from ventricular hypertrophy. So here is a list of the differential diagnosis for tall R waves in the anterior leads, namely V1 and V2. The tall R waves can be seen in patients with the right bundle branch block right ventricular hypertrophy in patients with the posterior myocardial infarction, which we're going to talk about in the chapter on ischemia and infarction. In thin athletes, we can see tall R waves in the anterior leads. We already talked about a couple of examples of acute pulmonary embolus. Primary pulmonary hypertension is another condition that can give rise to tall R waves, which of course is related to the right ventricular hypertrophy. 
juvenile pattern and of course WPW. WPW can not only mimic right ventricular hypertrophy, it can also mimic inferior wall myocardial infarction and a whole host of other things. We'll already talked about that in conduction disturbances on chapter 2 which you can watch on this YouTube channel. So let us continue. Okay, we talked about tall R waves in the anterior leads, but there are several conditions which can cause deep S waves in the anterior leads. So we might as well talk about them while we are talking about the anterior leads which represent the right ventricular activity. Under what conditions are we going to see deep S waves or RS waves in the anterior leads? We can be these can be seen in patients with the anteroseptal myocardial infarction. Definitely we see this pattern in patients with left bundle branch block. If you have a patient who has, a, who has an electrode in the right ventricle, we're going to see the pattern which is similar to the left bundle branch block. Again, I told you patients with uh, type B WPW can have deep S waves in the anterior leads uh, mimicking anterior myocardial infarction. Similarly, left ventricular hypertrophy. This is uh, an example of left ventricular hypertrophy that can cause deep S waves in the anterior leads. If the, if the leads are placed way up, it can produce uh, S waves in the anterior leads. And similarly, dextrocardia can produce uh, S waves as we particularly go on to the lateral chest lead. Let us continue here. So we are going to switch gears and look at left ventricular hypertrophy. So let us look at some of the findings in this electrocardiogram. I think we have already seen this electrocardiogram. If you don't remember, which is fine because we can start fresh. First of all, sinus rhythm, assuming. Then we have like a biphasic P waves in the inferior leads. We have a negative P wave in V1, which is occupying more than one square, suggestive of uh, left atrial enlargement. We have deep S waves we talked about in V1 and V2. We have tall R waves in V5 and V6 with discordant STT changes. So all the findings put together, we are looking at uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So it is not just left ventricular hypertrophy. We are talking about uh, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy with the strain or discordant STT changes. There's one more finding to top it off with the cream. We have a left axis deviation greater than minus 30 degrees. Uh, that means we are talking about uh, left anterior hemiblock in addition to left ventricular hypertrophy. To summarize, we have sinus rhythm, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, strain pattern, left axis deviation, and left anterior hemiblock. Good enough? Let's continue. Okay, here's another example of uh, left atrial enlargement, sinus uh, tachycardia at a rate of 100 per minute. We also have peaked P waves here, and we have deep S waves in the anterior leads, tall R waves in the lateral leads. So we are looking at uh, possibly bi atrial enlargement, uh, sinus uh, tachycardia with left ventricular hypertrophy and strain pattern. Along with that, we also see some tall peaked T waves. Whenever you see tall peaked P waves, you should always consider what? Hyperkalemia. We don't know if this patient has hyperkalemia. Is it possible this patient can have hyperkalemia? How are you going to say that? Well, there are a lot of things which may be interesting in this patient, which may suggest hyperkalemia because we have left ventricular hypertrophy. We have left atrial enlargement. We have strain pattern. So this could be a patient with renal disease. If this patient, if this is a patient with renal disease who has a kidney failure, who is on dialysis, who missed dialysis for a couple of days, and he comes back with this electrocardiogram, you would be thinking about uh, hyperkalemia. All right. Plus, we have non-specific T changes, T wave changes in the inferior leads. Let's move on. 
Okay, there are a lot of criteria that have been developed to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy, the most important of which is uh, Estes left ventricular hypertrophy criteria. It is also called as uh, Romhill Estes LVH criteria. So let us look at some of these points. They looked at all the different variables which we have been talking about like the axis deviation, atrial enlargement, increase in voltage, STT changes, all these things uh, can be combined together to see how significant are these changes to suggest left ventricular hypertrophy. By looking at just the voltage, if the R or S in any limb leads is greater than 2 millivolts or 20 millimeters in height, they give 3 points. Similarly, if S in V1 or V2 is greater than 20 millimeters, that's equal to three points. And if R waves in V5 and V6 are greater than 30 millimeters, that accounts for three points. Then we talked about the STT changes. Remember the discordant STT changes, they are worth three points. If the patient is on digitalis, you give only one point. If the left atrial enlargement is present, which is characterized by a negative deflection of greater than one small box that also counts for three points. Left axis deviation counts for two points. And again, we have the QRS duration and the intrinsicoid deflection. That is the time it takes for the QRS complex to reach the peak. Basically, you need five points to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy. In the previous examples we have seen so far, it hasn't been real difficult for us to diagnose because we had more than five points. There are a few other criteria that are described here. You can just pause the video and look at these. But from a practical point of view, when you're looking at an electrocardiogram, for the most part, people are spending less than 30 seconds. That means you should be able to synthesize all these points in a span of less than 30 seconds to come up with the finding that yes, we are dealing with the left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, the left ventricular strain, left axis deviation. So this is left ventricular hypertrophy and move on to the next test. It could be echocardiogram, nuclear stress test or whatever is waiting in the wings. We talked about left ventricular hypertrophy, but if you look at anatomically, there are various types of left ventricular hypertrophy. If you are talking of a patient with hypertension or aortic stenosis, we are talking concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, where the ventricle is of equal thickness all around. But there are other types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathies which can have, like here in this case, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. And here they're showing a picture of how part of the septum is removed using surgical technique. Then we also have another kind of hypertrophy known as the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is seen in young athletes and it has a pretty grave prognosis. And these patients need to be meticulously screened and treated. We also see increased voltage not only in patients who have left ventricular hypertrophy but also patients who have dilated cardiomyopathies or dilated hearts with congestive heart failure. You take for example a renal patient initially has concentric hypertrophy but with advanced hypertension and renal failure they can develop congestive heart failure where they can still have increased voltage but now we are looking at a dilated thin ventricle. So that's the congestive cardiomyopathy. So keep these things in mind when you are looking at the electrocardiogram. In other words, when you're looking at the electrocardiogram, you have to say, what kind of hypertrophy or dilatation am I looking at in this patient? Okay, here is an example now. So here we have left atrial enlargement, S waves in the anterior leads, R waves in the lateral leads, STT changes, so we got a left. So we have left ventricular hypertrophy with some STT changes in the inferior leads also. Here's another example where we have 
you know, remember I was talking about the intrinsic oil deflection. This is what we are talking about. The time it takes for the R waves to reach the peak. So again, here we have basically left axis deviation, left anterior hemiblock uh, and left ventricular hypertrophy with the strain. But more than strain, we have horizontal ST depression along with downsloping ST segment. So there may be more than just simple left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. And it is important to keep in mind these subtle changes, especially if someone presents with chest pain. Along with that, we also see here almost two to three millimeter ST elevation in the anterior leaves with deep s waves. This is not a sign of an acute anterior myocardial infarction. We see similar changes in patients with the left bundle branch block. So it is very important to recognize these changes. However, if this person comes with chest pain and has anterior wall ischemia, if these ST segments are down, or if the T waves are inverted, that may be significant in terms of uh, recognizing myocardial ischemia or even infarction in the presence of uh, these underlying basic changes of left ventricular hypertrophy. Let us continue. Okay, here we have another example of increased voltages in the lateral chest leads with T wave inversion. Look at the T waves, they are pretty narrow, deep T waves. And there's also left atrial enlargement. There are some STT changes in other leads. And this is an example of a patient with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And when you do an MRI or an echocardiogram, we can see that the thickness is not in the septum, the thickness is not in the lateral wall, but it is involving mostly the left ventricular apex. These patients are at high risk for sudden death. They are at high risk for serious cardiac arrhythmias and they need to be thoroughly evaluated and all the other family members need to be screened for any evidence of uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, let's continue. What do we see here? All right, we got a sinus tachycardia at a rate of 150 per minute. Now we have a right axis deviation. Now we have right ventricular hypertrophy. Along with that, we have left ventricular hypertrophy. We have non-specific STT changes in the lateral leads. We have some discordant changes in the anterior leads. What is your diagnosis? Well, this is some clue here. This is a child with a holosystolic murmur along the lower sternal border. So they're already giving you a tip. So what can cause right ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular hypertrophy in a child with right axis deviation and possibly left atrial enlargement? So we could be looking at uh, ventricular septal defect, which may be suggested by this hollow systolic murmur along the lower sternal border. That's where you hear the murmur for patients with uh, ventricular septal defect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long stretch, but that concludes the presentation on cardiac enlargement by electrocardiography. We have been talking about the EKG interpretation based on my book, Clinical EKG Interpretation and Patient Management. And stay tuned for our next presentation on sinus node dysfunction and bradycardias. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. I'm a cardiologist from Houston, Texas. And please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and we will see you next time.